The story of the Holland family in Westfield is one of those prime examples of the role of serendipity in research. Serendipity is that fancy word for surprises or unexpected benefits. And certainly, I didn't know anything about the Hollands, and most people in town don't know anything about the Hollands. Uh, about 25 years ago, when I began working in setting up the archives in the library, uh, one of the things that we discovered was a box of letters of the Holland family, uh, both to the Holland family and between the various members over four generations during the 19th century. Um, I set them aside. I didn't think much about them and went on to other tasks. One of the other things I was doing at the same time is I was giving uh, guided tours of the cemeteries. And while preparing for one of those tours of Pine Hill Cemetery, I happened upon a very unusual gravestone. On the northeast corner of the cemetery, up on the bluff, there was a large stone that had 21 names on it. There were 21 different Hollands buried on that site. And the most surprising thing about it is that seven of those Hollands had been doctors. Well, that set my curiosity aflame, and I went back to the box of letters and began to sort them out. And from that, I discovered one of Westfield's most interesting, and in many ways most challenging, family histories. Now, it's challenging because there is a printed family history. The trouble is, in many cases, it doesn't agree with what the letters of the people themselves say. But on and on, it's four generations of fascinating people. Now, the originator of the family is James Holland I. Now, I'm going to use that kind of designation, although it's not necessarily direct father to son, because there are numerous James Hollands. So we'll call him James Holland the first. He's born in the early 1800, or 18th century, early in the 1700s in Scotland, comes to Boston somewhere in the 1740s, eventually is one of the original settlers of Chester, Massachusetts. He is a doctor and grows with the little frontier community of Chester. When the Revolutionary War breaks out, even though he's in his 50s, he joins a revolutionary militia unit and, according to family history, fights in the revolution. Don't know exactly what that means. Throughout that period of time, he carries out some of the features that the family's best known for. First of all, the men are all large. They are all described as being over six foot tall and in adulthood somewhere between 250 and 350 pounds. They are all also noted for their personalities. They are all aggressive, obstinate, fighting with their neighbors, their friends, their family. Uh, they tend to be described as thoroughly unpleasant characters. This James I probably illustrates that with a couple of stories the family members told about him. It's said that at some point in time when he was living in Chester, he decided to wipe out a mountain nest of rattlesnakes. He took off his boots, not quite sure why, grabbed a hatchet and a shovel and leapt into the rattlesnake den. He killed all the rattlesnakes, was bitten a couple of times, and cured his own rattlesnake bites by cauterizing the wounds. Another story that's told about him, in his old age, he went to live with a daughter who had migrated to New York State on the shores of Lake Ontario in Oswego, New York. 
Um, he lived with her when he was in his early 90s. That was just when the War of 1812 broke out, and British raiders along the St. Lawrence River in Lake Ontario were opposed by a militia unit. James I, the family tells, grabbed his musket and at the age of 91 went to fight the British once again. Well, as I said, he sets a pattern for the rest of the family. Now, he had ten children, seven sons and five daughters. Of those sons, four of them were doctors. Doctors just as he was. Now, the family, this very large family, like all generations of this Holland family, was cursed by bad health. Of the children, the oldest son, Simon, was, ended up as a merchant in Troy, New York, and became involved with the Erie Canal. One son was a canal boat uh, captain. James, the second son, we'll skip for a moment, and William, the third son, we'll skip for a moment. Nancy, the oldest daughter, married a British prisoner of war from the Battle of Saratoga and died young. Samuel was a merchant in Greenfield, died in his 30s. Aaron, a doctor in Warren, Massachusetts, died in his 30s. Abraham, a doctor in Chester, Mass, died in his late 20s. George, a doctor with his brother in Warren, Massachusetts, died in his late 30s. Mary, the daughter, never married and died young. Elizabeth, the only daughter who survived to adulthood, married Richard Falley of the Falley musket fame and lived in the Falley home in Westfield, directly across the Court Street from the present Westfield Library. I want to go back and talk about those two sons I skipped. William, the oldest son, or the second oldest son, according to family genealogy, became a doctor, practiced in Westfield well, then New York State, and then went to Michigan, where it's said that he died in the 1840s. He's described as having one son, who was a professor at Trinity College in Hartford, and then goes to New York City where he's an attorney. However, the family letters describe something entirely different. Now, they agree that William was a doctor, but they say he went to North Carolina. There are letters from him in North Carolina. He had three sons, all of whom fought for the Confederacy. Two of them died. One of them, the third, his third son, also a William, also became a doctor. And in the early 1870s, there are letters from him back to the Westfield family asking for financial help in order to reestablish his practice and his home in North Carolina. Obviously, here's a case where documents disagree. Now, the oldest son, James, again replicates the family history. He's six foot three. He's described as heavy. He moves to Westfield in 1815, and he purchases a home on Court Street. Now, Court Street in the 1860s, and this is an image from the green looking to the west on Court Street, was the town's primary residence. It had the biggest homes in the 1860s and 70s. It is tree-lined with what was the early 19th century equivalent of mansions on both sides. And this is the home that he purchased. This is 
some of the Holland family standing in front of that home. He had nine children. Once again, many of them became doctors, five sons, four doctors, and one apothecary. We are at this point in time up to 10 Doctors Holland in the first two generations. Again, this is a family that is cursed by its medical history. Two sons and three of the daughters die of TB at a young age. His children are Homer, he's the oldest, we'll skip him for a moment. The oldest daughter is Lydia. She never married, and she is going to inherit this family home where she will live until she dies of old age in 1880. The second son is Virgil. He is a graduate of Harvard and the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. He's the first of the doctors, Holland, who has a very formal medical education. He came back to Westfield to practice and died of TB at age 29. The daughter, Mary, died at age 31, never having married. Daughter, Nancy, died at age 29, never having married. Son, John, became an apothecary in Westfield. In other words, he opened a drugstore and prepared medicines. He never married and died of TB at age 34. Daughter Elizabeth died in childbirth at 23. The youngest sons, James III, became a doctor. We'll skip him for a moment. And the youngest of them all, Charles, became a doctor and practiced in Huntington, Mass., where he died in 1855 at age 36, and his obituary describes him as crazed and debauched by alcohol and loose women. That's an unusual obituary in Yankee New England for this day and age. So let's go back and look at the sons who survived, just two, only three of these children reach adult, uh, full adulthood. We'll start with uh, James. James III is described as being over six foot tall, and at his death in 1880, over 250 pounds. He was a successful physician here in Westfield, he lived in his great aunt and uncle's house. Remember that his great aunt married Richard Falley's son. Their home was directly across the street from the library, and he owned that house. His office was next door in what's known as the Morgan Block. He was a successful surgeon successful individual so that when the Civil War broke out, he became a surgeon for the Mass 2nd Regiment of Cavalry. He served until 1863 when his health broke down and he came back home. He eventually rose to become uh, an elected legislator from Westfield. He married late in life. Uh, he married a widow, never had children. This is a picture of the Richard Falley home. The couple in the front on the right hand side, the rather portly gentleman in the top hat on the right, is James. Like the rest of the men in his family, his personality was big. His obituary describes him thusly. His intense partnership, partisanship, sometimes bordered on fanaticism. He was bitter in his animosities and sometimes unreasonable and unreasoning in his prejudices. An interesting description of a personality. Again, larger than life, very aggressive, 
although he, unlike most of his other relatives, was successful. Now, his brother Homer, also a practicing physician in Westfield, was big like the rest of the family. His personality straight traits were perhaps a bit stronger, a bit more intense. Uh, things went reasonably well for him in town, however, until his first wife died. Now, we don't know quite what went wrong, but there is a history of Westfield physicians written in the late 19th century by another doctor, and in the brief sketch of Homer Holland, he's described as a raving alcoholic. Probably that was his basic problem. Now, he had children. He had five children. Eldest is Eugene. He becomes a doctor. I'll skip him for a moment. His second was a son, Virgil. He died in childhood. His third was a son, William, who died of TB at 25. His fourth was a son, John, who died in childhood. And his fifth was a son, Henry. And I'll set him aside also for the moment. Now, at this point in time, we've got 11 Doctors Hollands in the direct line. Somewhere around 1854, after his first wife died, and I said Homer's personality took on a big change, he stopped practicing medicine. He began to dabble in science, and he eventually became fascinated with geology and searching for minerals. He took out a couple of patents on uh, methods of working gold and silver ores. He remarried a woman from Huntington. Now, we don't even know the woman's name. There are family letters describing this marriage and we know that the marriage tore the family apart and the town condemned it. Don't know why. Uh, his son, William, wrote a letter in which he describes this marriage. He says, quote, Our lawful and not real father is married again, and we are connected according to law to an embarrassing disgrace. Not quite sure what that means about the marriage. We only know the woman by her initials. Well, this controversy in town was returned by Homer in spades. He decided to leave Westfield with his new bride and he moved to Georgia to mine gold. Now, it's not well known, but North Georgia was the source of the original gold mines in America prior to California that provided most of the gold for coinage in the United States. Dahlonega in North Georgia still has a gold mining museum, and it was up to the Civil War one of the sources, of, one of the places for the United States Mint. Well, he moves to North Georgia to mine gold. And he writes to his son, Eugene, quote, I have given up on all my relatives and live now entirely with strangers. I care little for the fanatical New Englanders where reason is blind and philanthropy and humanity is a mockery and a hypocrisy. I have no friends there, and I wish none. Needless to say, this is the personality writ large. When the Civil War breaks out, he makes a quick trip back north, bringing his wife and a young son back to Huntington to live with their family. 
he returns back south and, according to his sons, quote, becomes a rabid secessionist, unquote, and becomes a soldier in the Confederate Army. Now, that seems a little difficult because by this time he's a man and he's 70 years old, but he certainly does become a rabid secessionist. We know that. He dies right at the end of the war in Virginia, 1865. His oldest son, Eugene, goes and gets him and brings his body back to Westfield to be buried in that family plot that I showed you. Speaking of Eugene, Eugene was the son of Homer who also had become a doctor. Uh, as the family arguments and fights split them apart in Westfield, he left Westfield and went west. He eventually settled in Colorado. Now, Eugene never married. He practiced medicine in Colorado. He also got very involved in mining. One of the things we have here in the Holland Collection is a fairly large collection of mining stocks and mining maps and mining prospectus. Uh, kind of an interesting thing about Colorado in the Civil War era. He also became uh, a local politician. He uh, ran for lieutenant governor. Um, he was defeated in battles over how to treat the Indians. Uh, he was a major opponent of some of the massacres of Indians that had taken place in Colorado in those days. And uh, when the Civil War broke out, he became a major general and commander of the Colorado militia. He kept contact with his brother back here in Westfield, his brother Henry, and so we have regular accounts of the Civil War in Westfield through this exchange of letters. As I said, after the war was over with, he went to Virginia collected his father's body and brought it back to Westfield for burial. Now, his brother, Henry. Henry did not become a doctor. He became an apothecary. He went to the New York College of Pharmacy and he opened a drugstore in Westfield. This is Henry. Henry's drugstore was on the green. It's the building on the left. Here's another shot of it, a close-up shot. Again, it's the building on the left. That building survives to this day. Here's a late 19th century picture. Again, it's the building on the left. Next to it is the Warrenoko Hotel, which sat on the green. You might recognize the building on the left if you think about taking the top story off. It is today's United Bank, which is the building right next door to the Westfield Library. This is the Holland Drugstore. It survived throughout most of the 19th century as a drugstore. Now, Henry was strange like the rest of his family. He uh, was unlucky in love. We have a number of his letters as he writes to other members of the family. He didn't marry until late in life. He had had a, a series of failed romances. He doesn't tell us exactly why, but he does lament them. Uh, he married late in life. They have one child, a James Holland IV, who also becomes a doctor. He's the 12th Holland doctor. Now, Henry, as I said, was unusual, like the rest of the males in his family. Um, he self-publishes a number of tracts. They're weird, philosophically filled with Bible quotes. He, by the way, also puts a number of inserts in the Westfield newspaper of the day of these biblical, apophrical quotes. One of his tracts in 1884 is titled, quote, An Anti-Slavery View. Now, slavery's long gone by this point in time. The subtitle is, On the War and Peace Criteria or Test, and the Syphilis Test, 
are nearly the only determinants of the value of creeds and doctrines. It doesn't make any more sense today than it apparently did in 1884. Another of his tracts is entitled, A Few Words on Circumcision, Baptism, and the Sabbath Day. Again, not quite clear what he intends. The, uh, the tracts are very, very small, very, very short, uh, and I can tell you that the contents make no more sense than the titles do. He got in trouble with local authorities a number of times for his uh, outbursts in public, strange and incoherent, they're often called. Not quite clear what's going on with them. When he died in 1906, his obituary says that he belonged to no church, no club, no political actions, and yet, on the other hand, he was the town historian for decades. He was the first vice president of the Hamden, Western Hamden Historical Society when it was founded. He was the clerk, that means today the secretary, of the trustees of the Westfield Athenaeum for 35 years. He also was deeply committed to civic improvements. In 1871, he founded the Westfield Improvement Association. He was fascinated by trees, and he made a catalog of all the largest trees in Westfield. It's a very, very interesting document to read. And he decided, at that point in time in the uh, mid-19th century, Westfield was almost treeless, and so he set about restoring the trees to Westfield. He laid out what is today Western Avenue from the cemetery to Russell Road and arranged to plant trees every 500 feet along that road. That road, because it's very level and straight, became the Westfield, excuse me, Westfield Raceway. Uh, in the late 19th century, young men with fast horses and light carriages used to race up and down that highway. He also was the individual who first sighted and laid out what would become Warrenoko Park, which is the today a housing development across from the college on Western Avenue. But in the early 20th century, it was a ma major resort center for Westfield. He engaged contractors to grade and smooth out Court Street Hill, Silver Street Hill, and he extended School Street uh, so that it extends out into King Street today. He also founded the Cemetery Improvement Association. And in fact, he is the first person to attempt to record all of the stones in the old Mechanic Street Cemetery. So strange as he was, unusual as he was, he in fact was a major contributor to the life of the citizens of Westfield in the late 19th century. And yet, like the rest of the generations of his family, he spent an awful lot of time fighting with his relatives. Now, at that point in time, his aunt, Lydia, still lived in the original family home. His uncle, James III, still occupied the Fally estate, the Fally home on Court Street. And his brother, Eugene, had returned from Colorado to practice medicine in Westfield. Uncle James struck a deal with the Methodist Church to give up his property for the new Methodist Church building, which was moved off the green. That is the site of the current Methodist Church today. That Fally home was pulled to the back of the property. 
James decided that he wanted to build himself a new mansion that would represent the new age of the Gilded Age in the late 19th century. And according to Henry, he succeeded in persuading his sister Lydia to give up the family home a little farther up Court Street. James tore that home down and built a new mansion, one of the great mansard roof mansions on the street. According to Henry, it cost $40,000 and bankrupt James. James never got to live in it, for he died a month before it was completed. Sister Lydia died two months later, and nephew Eugene, Henry's brother, died a few months later, leaving only Henry and Henry's family as the last surviving Hollands in town. Now this magnificent home went into bankruptcy. Eventually, the home ended up in the hands of one of the Westfield whip manufacturers, the Van Dusen family. Now this stretch of Court Street became the site of a number of mansions. Right next to it was the Bush Miller Mansion. Again, one of these massive mansard roof, three-story mansions of the Gilded Age. Now, if you want to get a proper perspective, the Bush Miller home eventually became the site of the Church of Atonement. And the Holland Van Dusen home next to it eventually became abandoned in the 1930s, went into disrepair and was torn down in the 1950s. Bricks from the home were made into what some older residents of Westfield may remember as the Three Little Pigs, three small brick homes that were erected next to the Church of Atonement and were torn down about 15 years ago for the Arbor's Rest Home. By the late 1880s then, all that's left of the Hollands in Westfield are Henry, his wife, and his young son, James IV. James is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. He becomes a doctor in Westfield also. When the Spanish-American War breaks out, he tries to enlist in the army as an army surgeon. He has health problems like so many other generations of his family did. Uh, he has kidney disease. Uh, they called it Bright's disease then. Uh, the best he can work is he becomes a contract surgeon for the U.S. Army when they go into the Philippines. And from 1900 through 1902, he serves in the Philippines as a civilian doctor under contract to the Army. He succeeds in antagonizing the Army, largely because he exposes the horrors of the crushing of the Philippines insurrection. It's a little-known war in American history, but America took more casualties in the Philippines War than it did in the Spanish-American War before it. And the American troops are notorious for essentially the terrorist campaign they carried out against the Philippine soldiers. Uh, that's where waterboarding came from. That was the origination of waterboarding. Uh, American soldiers may very well have killed tens of thousands, massacred tens of thousands of Filipinos. Well, James IV writes about it, complains about it. Uh, in fact, among his papers, there are a couple of rather acidic, sarcastic pieces of poetry that he wrote about the atrocities carried about by the American soldiers. In 1902, he comes back to Westfield and establishes his practice. 
who becomes a member of the Board of Health. When Noble Hospital is created, he becomes resident physician there. He is the official medical examiner in Westfield. In 1904, he marries. He is in his 40s at this time. Like many other male members of his family, he marries late and dies 11 months later of kidney disease on his 37th birthday. His father dies 18 months later, leaving only his widowed mother in town and his own widow of 11 months. She soon leaves Westfield and disappears from history. Henry's widow, James IV's mother, lives on in town until the 1920s. From her estate, she leaves a number of bequests in recognition of the Holland family. She creates the Holland Book Fund in the library. She creates the Holland Shade Tree Fund to keep up the parks in the city of Westfield. She creates the Holland Cemetery Fund to keep upkeep in the Mechanic Street Cemetery. And in 1920, she donates the first x-ray unit to the Westfield Hospital. In fact, if you go to Bay State Noble today and go back into the x-ray root unit, there is a plaque on the wall giving recognition to this fact. When she dies in 1923, the Holland family is extinct for the first time in a century in Westfield. All that remains is the cemetery stone and a street sign. Holland Avenue, directly across on Court Street from the library, which was the site of the Valley slash Holland home until it became the site of the Methodist Church. Other than that, all memory of the Holland family has disappeared. They were, in their day, unusual, difficult, controversial. But they also played an integral part of Westfield history and in their own way made important contributions to the development of the community of Westfield.